comprehensive, relevant, and insightful conversations about health and medicine happen here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. By the time we reach our 50s, it seems most of us know someone who has been treated for breast cancer. According to the American Cancer Society, one in eight women will get a breast cancer diagnosis in her lifetime. Nearly 275,000 women and men are newly diagnosed with breast cancer each year. But what happens after they hear those dreaded words, you have breast cancer? We're talking today with breast surgeon Dr. Mon Farha, medical director of the Breast Center at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital in Baltimore, to learn more about the breast cancer journey after a diagnosis. I'm your host, Deborah Schindler. Welcome to Doc Talk. Oh, thank you, Deborah, for inviting me for this. This is very special. The word journey is used a lot when talking about cancer treatment, not so much in other chronic disease or illness. Why is that? A lot of patients, it's a beginning. There's a beginning and an ending. The journey is often complicated. Sometimes it's simple, but often complicated with multiple courses of treatment, a lot of handoffs between specialties. And that's why we feel that you start something, you finish it, and hopefully you will survive your normal life after that. Mm -hmm. When you say handoff, that's where the comprehensive care comes in. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very important is to plot a path for the patient. You can adjust it as you go along as more information comes in. You have to have an outline for that path so that you can plan the proper workup, have the proper resources, specialty resources, and so that the patient understand what they're going to go through. Some degree of certainty on the patient's side will decrease their anxiety and make them more adherent to treatment as well. There are more than 3.8 million breast cancer survivors in the United States. This includes women still being treated and those who have completed treatment. Why is breast cancer still a leader among cancers in the United States uh, in terms of numbers? There is no clear explanation for that. The trend has been increasing number of cases. There was a period where people thought that mammography might be detecting cancers early, and that's why we had an increase in the number of cases. But this should have leveled off since mammography use is all over the place. So is it our diet? Is it our environmental exposures? Is it uh, There was a period where a lot of women were getting estrogen replacement, which may have contributed to that. Uh, a lot of women take birth control and other hormonal treatments that might affect that. There is no single cause. So it could be a number of factors, many of them outside our control. Do you get most of your patients in here um, as a result of a mammogram or other means of detection? Nowadays, the large majority of patients are detected by mammography, which is a good thing, meaning most patients are detected as stage one. The majority of our patients that we see have either small tumors with negative lymph nodes or even sometimes, many times, pretty early precancerous disease like what we call ductal carcinoma in situ. This is one we call stage zero, which has almost 100% cure rate. Now, there are some patients who either don't do their screenings or haven't seen a doctor for a while, and this increased with the pandemic. Uh, or they have particularly aggressive tumors that grew very fast between screenings, these may present at a later stage, stage two, three, sometimes stage four even. Let's start at the beginning of a patient's breast cancer journey. A woman may or may not have symptoms, but let's say a patient feels a lump or her mammogram reveals something. What happens next? Uh, the fortunate thing is that uh, we have a lot of ways to diagnose the cancer and evaluate these abnormalities with minimally invasive techniques. It used to be that patients have to go to the operating room to have a biopsy. Almost all biopsies nowadays are done with using ultrasound, mammography, and sometimes MRI using needles. Mm -hmm. And these biopsies are done under local anesthesia. They're very well tolerated, minimal discomfort, and you don't have to do much preparation for them. Patients could go back to work the same day. It's, they're simple biopsies. I imagine getting a biopsy, you're waiting with bated breath for the results, right? The initial reading should be within one to two days. Now, you could do additional testing of the tumor when the biopsy is positive, meaning it has a cancer. We do receptors and so on. That might take longer than that. But the initial reading of the pathology should be within one or two business days. What about men? Uh, are they typically symptomatic? And how is breast cancer diagnosed with them? What's their course of treatment going to be like? How is it going to be different from a woman's? 
So the most men who present with breast cancer present with masses. They, have a they lump. either they have a it. lump uh, that was felt by the patient, his doctor, or a family member who notices something. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is no screening for men with breast cancer. The incidence is very low, and you really can't justify screening. So the majority of patients present with a lump that's palpated, felt by the patient. Sometimes changes in the nipple also, because many of these tumors start underneath the nipple. Mm-hmm. So if the nipple gets retract, retracts or there's some ulceration in the nipple, that's how they often present. Is there also a genetic propensity for men in the same way that there is for women? So there's a higher incidence of genetic mutations in men who have breast cancer. A larger proportion of breast, male breast cancers would have a genetic mutation. While for women, it might be 3 or 4% of women will have genetic mutation. For men, it could be as high as 30%. Wow. Does that mean their sons are at risk to get it? Absolutely. If either the mother or the father test positive for a genetic mutation, uh, that makes the children and siblings automatically eligible for genetic testing. And they could run 50-50 chance of inheriting that gene. So I know you said the incidence of male breast cancer is very low, but if a woman has breast cancer and she has the gene, does that mean her sons are equally exposed to... I guess it doesn't since the incidence is so low. Well, the children may inherit the gene, and that gene may predispose them to breast cancer or other cancers. Many of these uh, mutations are associated with other cancers, such as pancreatic cancer, uh, bladder cancer, and so on, colon cancer. So depending on the mutation, patients are screened in different ways. So it depends on the gene. Let's get back to diagnostics. Tell me more about what is done and walk me through the process. So let's take the simplest biopsy is an ultrasound-guided biopsy, for example. It's a barely palpable or a mass that we can't feel at all that was discovered on mammography and ultrasound. The day of the biopsy, the patient will come. We'll scan her with the ultrasound. Mostly the radiologists do these. I do some. Many of the other surgeons do them too. Uh, While we're scanning the tumor with the ultrasound, we inject some numbing medicine in the skin. The patients feel very little discomfort. And with a very small needle, go into the mass, guided with the ultrasound, get four, five, six samples. We send that to pathology, and this is the extent of the biopsy. Patients mm-hmm. will have some bruising and some mild discomfort, which is almost always managed with acetaminophen or something like that. So if the results come back that it's not breast cancer, what else could it be? So there's a variety of pathology that could cause abnormal mammograms. Fibroadenomas are one of the common ones. These are benign tumors we don't worry about. Sometimes it's high-risk lesions, such as atypical hyperplasia, radial scar, where we have to go in and remove these to make sure there's nothing around these lesions. And sometimes just plain fibrocystic disease uh, that turns out to be benign and the patients just need to be monitored. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would say a majority of the breast biopsies are benign. Uh, Only about 20, 30% of them turn out to be cancerous. Okay, so when they do come back cancerous, uh, you get that report from the lab, and then what? You call the patient? Do you have them come in face-to-face to to give them that news? And are you the one who delivers the news? It is the responsibility of the performing physician to inform the patient or to make sure the patient is informed. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if I do the biopsies, we usually schedule an appointment with the patient to come in a short period of time so that uh, we give them the results. Always better to give it face-to-face. Even with a benign result, it's always better to give it face-to-face. You'll have the opportunity to explain things. It has an opportunity that I look at the imaging again and say, this is concordant, that what we got explains what we see on the mammogram and to define what are the next steps. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, however, we're pushed to do it on the phone. It's a holiday coming up, or it's a large lesion, or the patient lives far, uh, like in Harford County or uh, Cecil County. Then Mm -hmm. sometimes we we give them heads up that this might be a cancer, and we could call them about that, have them prepared. Nobody wants to be surprised with a short call when they're driving with with a result like that. Sure. It's always good to treat these things uh, efficiently and quickly, right. physically and mentally, both right. physically and mentally. 
How is that for you? Is it, I mean, is it always a difficult meeting to have with a patient when you have to give them the news that they have breast cancer? Yeah, it, there is some difficulty in, at, attached to it because we identify with our patients right. and the patient identify with us and, and they always want to hear good news. But when the news is bad, you have to give it and you have to. The most important thing is to have a plan mm. in your mind have a plan, what's going to happen next? What are the patient's liability? Uh, The patient wants to know that you know how to deal with this and you have a plan for them. That eases the discomfort or the unpleasantness of the diagnosis. So when you're giving them the diagnosis, you're already going into it with a plan. You've already talked to a medical oncologist or what's played out behind the scenes when you meet with a patient? So there are many, many paths this happens. Before I go in to see the patient or I call them, I go back, look at the mammogram, look at the pathology report. If there's any question, I might look at the slides with the pathologist and then say, hmm, this is probably early stage disease that needs surgery first. And we know how to deal with it afterwards. So now I have a plan that this is early stage and it's very likely that surgery will become first, but you will meet all the team members where we sit down, discuss your case, and have a good plan for you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we have a patient with a very large tumor, clinically positive lymph nodes, we say, you know, this is very aggressive disease. Uh, So we have, we know that many of these patients will need chemotherapy first. Again, we're prepared. We look at the imaging, we look at our notes, and when we talk to the patient, we are prepared to tell them, What's the likely scenarios that might play out over the next few months? Mm-hmm. What questions do they usually come back to you with? Uh, you know, it, it varies. Uh, the young patient is worried about their children. Am I going to be there for my children? Right. The older patient might worry, do I have to have chemotherapy and radiation? So it varies according to patient. The most central to all of these is survival and how much treatment do I need to get to survive this cancer? These are the two things that are most most important for the patients. Would you say that more often than not, that you feel very positive, you know, about their survival or because of all the modern techniques or medical oncology is doing amazing things with immunotherapy? I'm with you 100% on this. Right, so the large majority of breast cancer patients are cured from the disease. Good. People t- avoid using the word cure because it could come back 20 years later. But patients who survive 5, 10 years are largely cured from the disease. Okay, So the large majority of patients, all comers, are cured from the disease. That's one. The second thing, we have so many tools nowadays to treat even the most aggressive disease, triple negative disease, HER2 positive disease, and treatments keep piling up. New options keep piling up. New options that are targeted, more specific, that manipulate the immune system to kill the cancer. Uh, these have many less side effects, and they are much more effective many times. So patients, even patients who have stage 4 metastatic breast cancer, if they fail some treatment, we have two or three other choices now. And in two years, we, have, we might have 10 choices. Every three, four months, a breakthrough comes through. Uh, this is a very exciting period because mm-hmm. I think in the next five to 10 years, the ch- what we're doing now will change dramatically, will be less aggressive and less side effects, I think. You know, at my age, I should be getting annual screenings for a lot of different things. And the one that I don't ever miss is the mammogram because of the fear of, I mean, it just... Again, there's two sides to that. One is that it's very highly curable. The other side, it's a very emotional experience for patients. Mm -hmm. Even patients who have trivial amounts of disease, you tell them that diagnosis and could be emotionally devastating for some. You could be 85 years old and you tell the patient she has DCIS and and that's not going to be more than a nuisance for her. She still gets upset about it. For some reason, this is a very emotional disease, and you can't help that. You can't do anything about it. You can't help. Any cancer, I would think that that is going to be true. Analysis and staging seems to be very complicated. I mean, I've been hearing you describe different kinds of breast cancers and at different stages of their growth process. How do you simplify that for patients? Uh, Why is it important for them to understand that part of their diagnosis? 
So people have to understand why they are going through difficult treatments. And unless they understand why they're struggling, why are they, why are they giving me these toxic medications? Why am I getting radiation? And to understand that, you have to give them enough information about the extent of disease. And to determine the extent of disease, you need to check if it's spread somewhere. Sometimes patients may need a PET scan. Patients may need a CAT scan. We do MRIs frequently to evaluate the extent of the disease in the breast. So this gives us an idea of the clinical stage of the patient. The clinical stage is a, our best estimate about the extent, whether it's localized in the breast, whether it's spread to the lymph nodes, or whether it's spread somewhere else. Once we know that, that defines the treatment course for the patient. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, breast cancer is not one entity. You could divide it into the estrogen progesterone receptor positive disease, HER2 negative disease. That's a disease that doesn't respond very well to chemotherapy and responds better to hormonal therapy. And frequently is not as aggressive as the other varieties. So the focus in ERPR positive HER2 negative disease is on the local regional disease, treating the breast and managing the armpit, the axilla where these tumors could spread. However, triple negative disease or HER2 positive disease is more aggressive and has a tendency to spread to the rest of the body. It could spread to the lungs, to the bone, to the liver, sometimes the brain, wow. uh, other parts. So the focus of treatment will be on dealing with the systemic disease, the spread, managing the spread. So many patients who have triple negative disease or HER2 positive disease will receive their chemotherapy first because that treats the body and treats the tumor in the breast itself. And once the chemotherapy is largely finished, then we operate on them. And if they need radiation, they receive the radiation after surgery. Understanding the extent of the disease and the variety of the cancer is very important in determining how the patient is treated. And you're mapping out that approach or that the strategy for treatment with a team. Tonight, Correct. Tell me about that. The traditional way that people have done it is to go to one office after another. They see the surgeon, then they see the radiation oncologist, then they see the medical oncologist. Sometimes they don't get to the radiation oncologist or medical oncologist till after surgery. And in between, the patients are listening to different stories from different people that are disconnected and not well-coordinated. We think that that's not a good way to do this. We discuss patients first in our multidisciplinary treatment planning conference. We review the pathology, uh, we review the imaging together, and we discuss the patients and outline what are different options and what's the best path for that patient. Then we see the patient in our multidisciplinary clinic together. Myself, my medical oncologist, my radiation oncologist, Dr. Mohaptash and Fowler, most often, mm -hmm. go and see the patient together. We'll have a lively discussion with the patient. The patient asks the question. We could agree or disagree in front of the patient. At the end, this not only creates confidence in the patient that they're at the center of our attention, but that we're thinking about their problem and we coordinate in the care together. That's really important. Then once the process is outlined, then it's important to define what, how we transition from one treatment to another. It's almost like getting a built-in second opinion by having a comprehensive care team. Uh, yeah, I like that. And the second opinion is on the pathology. If the slides are done somewhere else, we bring them, we look at them. If the imaging is done somewhere else, we also review it together uh, with our radiologist. And the people I work with are outstanding breast cancer professionals. So they understand the surgical process, like I understand the chemotherapy process, I understand the radiation. It is almost like getting second and a third opinion at the same time. When is the right time to get a second opinion for a patient? Is it right after her diagnosis? Second opinions could come in handy if you're not clear about what was explained to you. If there are a lot of uncertainties about the treatment path, if you have doubt about the team that's taking care of you, or if you're not responding well to treatment. There are also some cases that are very unusual where second opinions are absolutely necessary. Rare cases like angiosarcomas of the breast or, or rare tumors. Other than that, I think the patients uh, want to see that their doctors care for them, 
they're competent and have their interest in the center of their treatment plan. What's the takeaway here for patients or people who are listening and have a loved one who may have received a, a diagnosis recently? What is the most important thing you want them to know today? I'm going to start that by saying that it's important for people not to ignore symptoms and to do their screenings. This will give them hopefully early stage cancer, which could have 97% or 98% cure rate. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if you diagnose with breast cancer, just think that there's a lot of hope and that the majority of patients do very well and that there's a price to that. And that price could be surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, hormonal therapy. Uh, then that they have to understand their treatment plan. Why am I doing this? When they deal with their team, with their care providers, the provider has to explain to them what's their diagnosis, what is required to give them the best chance at cure, and that their care is coordinated between the different specialties. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have doubt about understanding the disease, if they have doubt that this treatment is not really good for them or that there's very poor coordination, that's a time for to get a second opinion. I what advice do you have for questions that a patient should ask her doctor in these early meetings? The most important thing is to write your questions down because the moment the patient faces the doctor, what did I want to they ask? Forget, so they, they forget. They forget. They forget. The patient needs to know the type of cancer they have. Uh, the second thing they need to know is the extent of the disease in the breast. The third thing they need to know is the extent of disease outside the breast. And then what's the usual course of the disease? What's the treatment? What are the side effects of the treatment? How long does it take to finish the treatment? The treatment could be tough, especially chemotherapy could have significant side effects and so on. One factor we didn't touch on also is reconstruction, uh, breast reconstruction for either partial mastectomies or more often for uh, total mastectomies. That's a complicated set of decisions. The reconstructive process is a complicated set of decisions. Mm -hmm. One of them is the timing of reconstruction. The second is the method of reconstruction. So if a patient, for example, has a very aggressive tumor that needs chemotherapy and radiation, maybe they should delay the final reconstruction till they finish treating the cancer. We tend to prioritize treating the cancer to the reconstructive part. Then you come to the point where you're deciding whether you have your own tissue reconstruction, what are the risks of these procedures, whether you have implant reconstructions. Again, that's another tough decision process that requires a lot of thinking and Conversations. Conversations. It requires multiple conversations with the team, with both the plastic surgeons, the reconstructive surgeons, and the tr cancer treatment team, because they too have to coordinate with each other so that we don't do an immediate reconstruction and delay chemotherapy for three months, for example. We don't want to do that. Any final thoughts on anything that we've discussed? Thank you. I think the most important thing, diagnose early. Do not ignore symptoms. Understand your treatment from A to Z and uh, look for a multidisciplinary approach to the treatment. We've been talking with Dr. Man Farha at the Breast Center at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital in Baltimore. Thank you, Dr. Farha, for sharing your expertise with us here on Doc Talk. You are welcome. For more information about getting a breast cancer diagnosis or to schedule an appointment, visit MedStarCancer.org or call 443 443- 444-4673 at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital.